Really? We're a lot better than that in Austin. Just saying. Come on. Louisville, wake up. Get the energy, the oxygen. Come on, wake up. Hello, Louisville! Man. It's like pulling teeth. Everybody here for the malware talk, right? If you're not, there's the door. <laughs> My name is Michael Goff. I'm the lead for B-Sides Texas. I do the Austin Con. I just want to say our badges are cooler. We have like bottle openers in ours, so they're really functional. Just saying, just saying. And my partner here, Ian Robertson. Good afternoon. Hope everybody's doing good and you got a good lunch today. You ready for some malware, malware management framework? Yeah. yeah. All right. Ready to kick its ass? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Afterwards, it'll be loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Participation is required here. We're going to ask some questions. We want to see a show of hands. Uh, we are keeping stats, so that's why we want you to participate. And then... Uh, Pam, where's the bag? Where'd she go? She took the bag with her. You got the bag? So uh, for those that ask the really, really good questions, we do have some swag to uh, toss out. So uh, four good questions, four good pieces of swags. Everybody here needs a t-shirt that's not black, right? <laughs> Awesome. So, logo wear, good stuff. All right, so participation. We're going to want to show of hands. Uh, this is somewhat interactive. We want to hold off the main questions till the end, but if you want a clarification point, then please ask the question, right? Interact. Participation. So, quick poll. How many people here practice malware and forensics duty as part of their job? Hold your hands up. So, about a third of you guys. That's pretty good. How about of those people out there? Um, to do the basics. How many people do the advanced malware and forensic stuff? Uh, you're getting into actually tearing it apart, looking at the CNC, looking to see what domains it's doing, uh, that sort of thing. About a quarter. Okay. Good. And of course, how many of us don't have time to do this as much as we want to? Yeah. Okay. About a good third to a half. All right. Good deal. So how many organizations respond to suspect? How do you do this? How do you respond to the suspected malware? Do you guys uh, accept AV as, you know, hey, it scanned it and found it? Am I going to see any hands? Zero. Oh, awesome. It's going down every time we do one of these pressos. <laughs> OK, uh, do you run another AV scan? Since you didn't believe the first one, I guess the second point's moot as well. How about re-image workstation? How many of you guys re-image workstations as part of this? So about 20 25%. Depends on the indicators. So if you have an unknown, do you re-image? Just, I can't, I don't know. I'm not going to spend the three hours, four hours. I don't have the time. What access they have. Interesting. So if they're an admin, re-image them. Not an admin, maybe not a problem. Interesting. C-levels. Not going to re-image the C-levels? Oh, they definitely. Oh, okay, we got pick on management over here. How about servers? What do you guys do about servers? Do you re-image servers? Raymond servers, anybody? Got some snapshots. Okay, VM snapshots. So not much. Restores. How do you know the restore is good? Just saying. Okay, how many people here investigate for just a few hours when they're doing this malware stuff? A few hours. Minutes. Okay. <laughs> minutes. Right, let's start with minutes. We'll go down one. How many people here spend minutes doing it? Because we might get more hands. Okay, so less than 5%. Hours? Around 5%. Days, 3%. Weeks, like really seriously spent a lot of time doing this, probably this event. So those that said that you were advanced and even the ones that are generalists, you're not spending a lot of time with it, are you? Okay, good to know. How many people bring a third party in for forensics analysis? A mandiant productivity, people like us. A couple hands, so yeah, less than 5%. So the point is, a lot of low numbers here. For those who went, didn't go down the path of deep forensics, how many of you are relatively confident your system's clean, that it's not infected? <laughs> Zero hands. So kind of praying, huh? 
So interesting. So if you notice, a lot of, not a lot of you guys raised your hands. So our confident level is definitely low or zero. You don't have a lot of time or spend a lot of time. And very few of us are experts. It's kind of the take of that. So according to CyberArk, uh, I found this interesting. If you believe vendor slides, I'm, I'm just saying this is what they report. So I report it because I find it entertaining. So CyberArk makes a password management solution if you don't know who they are. But they say 51% of our systems are currently pwned based on whatever study they did, however they did it. And 57% of us put too much value in AV. Would everybody agree that we put too much value in AV or management puts too much value in AV? Do any of you put any value in AV? Not much. Wow. This is a tough crowd for this stuff. I don't tell you. I'm really impressed. All right. How about the total quantity of malware over 10 years? Now, this is interesting because how many people here know actually the numbers? So this is total malware. This is new malware. In 2012, there were 110 million pieces of new malware reported. Okay. By May of this year, January to May of 2013, it exceeded the new malware of all of 2011. So if you notice this graph, it's just skyrocketing, and 2013 is going to be even taller. If you notice, there's 2012, 2011, so we're already at 2013 higher, and we still have seven, eight months based on May. So serious numbers, yes? That's a good question. AV test doesn't report that info, so we don't know. Yes, they'll be unique by hash, correct. No worries. So one thing for sure, no worries. One thing for sure is everybody's seen the Verizon and TrustWave slides. Uh, we are taking way too long to detect this stuff, right? If you look at the actual statistics, both Verizon report, which is zero in seconds, minutes, and hours of detecting a compromise, and whoops. That wasn't supposed to happen. And also, uh, TrustWave saying the same thing, very low. They have different market spaces. But the bottom line is, we are in this space here, a very low detection to compromise. Does everybody agree with this? Would this be an accurate number? Yes? So bottom line, lots of stuff out there. It's taking too long to detect. Now, Sophos is interesting. I love Sophos. Chet Wisniewski is a friend. And they published this on their blog. 70% of all malware is unique to one company. 80% of all malware is unique to 10 or less companies. That's important because that tells you the AV industry is focusing on 20% of the malware that affects 80% of us, right? The production, typical, variant type malware that's mass produced. But 80% of it is unique to a handful of us in this room. And they'll have a different variant or different type and they'll have a different type and so on. It takes too long to find this stuff. It's labor intensive. We kind of conclude that from the questions we ask you. Forensic software, how many people here are in case fanatics? Or use it, but not fanatics. <laughs> it's difficult stuff to use. And it, again, we asked the question in the beginning. A very small subset can do this. OK, that's the problem with some of these solutions. And they do require advanced expertise. Now, there's a lot of us in this room, but yet only a small subset of us are using these tools. And security solutions are part of the problem. They take too long to implement, they're complicated, they cost a lot of money. How many people here own like every security product in their environment? You know, Tripwire, Bit9, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Sourcefire, FireEye. It's too expensive. We can't literally afford to keep adding on and adding on and adding on. So again, how many people here have open environments? What I mean by that is unfortunately there are administrators who will admit to them having open environments where people are administrators, not a lockdown environment. A lot of you should be raising your hands. I know you don't want to admit it, but a lot of you should be raising your hands. And AV detects too little, right? And the stuff that we've analyzed, we get 3% detection rate in virus total. And the only reason we get that high is because A, it was mailed to us, and B, the stuff we received phishing-wise that is targeted to us does not get detected by our AV solution. So from our AV perspective, it's a zero hit, but if we put it up at virus total, 3%. And Dave Kennedy actually stated this uh, when he was in uh, Austin at a talk and also on a CNN segment. So a lot of us kind of get it. It's really, really low detection rate. How about whitelisting solutions? How many people here use whitelisting? Yeah, less than <laughs> like 1%, 2%. All right, how many people here think it's complicated or too hard to implement in their environment because they're not restricted enough so it, it's easier in a more restricted environment? Difficult to, to consume and implement, right? Firewall integrity stuff, uh, we're Tripwire users. 
by default, Tripart does not look everywhere. That's kind of a flaw because if we know that, then the bad guys know that. And businesses want solutions in kind of one of three categories. We were at a presentation where we had an instant, interesting response from one of the people that was at a source fire fire. I forget the people that are all there. They either want them that they're easily added. They don't want disruption or they want something to replace the solutions they have to reduce labor. How many people here have management that wants to reduce the solutions in order to cut down labor? Right? We keep bolting on stuff. We have to keep adding labor. It's cost, 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 right? We're a cost center. We're really not a profit center from a management's perspective. Wrong thinking, I know. But that's the reality. The ideal solution is can I replace stuff? And again, it's part of the problem. We have to deal with this in managing our environments. Breaches are expensive. Anybody here going to admit they had breaches? Okay. <laughs> Statistics say you're all lying. I know you don't want to admit it. You don't want to raise your hands because we know where you work and all that. I get it. Downtime, user impact, uh, we've been there. We're going to share a little bit with you later. Uh, customer impact, reputation, right? It's a big deal. Your confidence. What do you do if you have one system compromise? Ten? A hundred? A thousand? Workstations seem to be re-imaged okay, but hardly anybody raised their hand for servers. So how do we deal with this issue? It's a big problem. How much does it cost? <sighs> if you fail. I'm dying to do that. <laughs> yep, it's getting hot in here. It's about to take off while you're about to get fried. <laughs> so cost of a breach. Um, interesting information. So we, we've had a couple where we worked. We're kind of famous for Texas's largest uh, data leak. Um, but thanks to South Carolina, we got some really good numbers. And Ponymon keeps reporting these things um, regularly. Now the cost per record is going down. Why is that? The amount of records are skyrocketing in losses. So, yeah, it's going down. No, it's not. The losses are actually going up because your record count's going up. Sony, if you look at their stock value during their monstrous exploit and compromises they had, lost one-third of their stock value. Man, that's Harry Carey time for executives, right? Fire, 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 fire. South Carolina, over $15 million in expenditures. They spent over $12 million just in identity theft protection services. $12 million. So they're well in the 20s and 30s by now. In Texas, we easily spent over 3.5 million records. We spent easily over $10 million. Again, uh, notifying the taxpayers, uh, getting them protection services, consultants, incident response, et cetera, et cetera. It's expensive. Now, thank God for uh, public disclosure, you know, open records. We get this data and we can actually see what companies will, will agree to disclose. And again, uh, interesting response by Kaspersky, it says there that the average incident costs $649,000 for a big company. That's a lot of dough, can buy a lot of security products. Uh, and incident response, a typical one, notice the spreadsheet, uh, that's a typical small compromise. You bring somebody like Mandian in, that's what it costs you per week. So it's an expensive thought. There's the details of the, of the South Carolina the things to point out here, uh, this, a lot of this presentation is online at the website you're going to see. 44 systems were compromised with 33 pieces of unique malware. Only 44. And it cost over $25 million. Anybody want to do the math? Crazy. So what do you do? Do you hope for the best? Does everybody here kind of hope for the best? Is that where we're at? Show of hands. How many people here, based on the hands that were raised earlier, hope for the best? Do you feel there's anything we can do? Yes? A lot of no's shaking out there. That's why we're here. You're going to learn how to do it better. So uh, we use a term called moving with the speed of business. This is, I want, you know, I have an issue. I want to fix it. I want to move on fast, right? I don't want to spend a lot of time with the forensics like the hands shown earlier. Management expects fast results. We don't want to impact the users. We need to move with, you know, we get our products out, our developers back to work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all lack budget. How many people here don't lack budget? One. Lucky guy. <laughs> He's hiring, by the way. <laughs> about 100 openings. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, how about lack of resources? How many people have definitely lack of resources? Everybody, right? So we all lack resources. We don't have money. We need more resources. Don't have them. But we need to get back up and running fast. So basically, we need, you know, malware just to go away. So what's the solution? So I'm going to introduce to you what we call the malware management framework. It's easy. It's not hard to do. It's a new concept. So how many people here practice vulnerability management? Come on, everybody's hand should go up. Everybody looks or signs up for vulnerabilities from Microsoft, Cisco, blah, blah, blah. And we look at those and we use Nexpose or Nessus to scan for them and then we get our people to patch them. So we all do that. So why not treat malware like vulnerabilities, right? It's something, there's data there that we can look for in some way, form, or manner. 
you know you're going to have problems with it, right? Just like vulnerabilities. So monitor it and then respond to it. That's kind of the concept. Treat malware the same way we do vulnerabilities. Simple. Understand what you have. Use the good to find the bad. Simple enough, right? You may not understand everything you have, but that's okay. I don't know everything that's on my wire. That's okay, okay? Because we know that's the reality. So we have to basically take this big iceberg and we're going to chip away at it a little bit at a time. But you can eliminate 90% or more of the chaff, which in this case we refer to as the hay. We're looking for a needle in a haystack, right? To find the needle, eliminate the hay, the good stuff. And then you have a better chance of finding the bad stuff. Anybody read this report? Know anything about the report? Really? Nobody knows anything about WinNTI. Well, with APT1, everybody had to come out with reports. Because first it came out with this 80-page report this April. And it talks about a five-year program, give or take, that's attacking the uh, gaming industry. We know a lot about this. We discovered it in May 2012, or yeah, roughly May 2012. We didn't quite know what it was until months later in regards to collecting it and seeing what was going on, and then obviously reading this thing kind of put two to two together. Um, but we did meet with the feds over it, so we know a little bit about the subject. It's virtually no cost to set up. Hey, budget. We have some resources, but we don't need more. No products need to be purchased if you want to do this, right? You can do it manually. We're going to talk about how to do that. It's easy enough to maintain. It is a different mindset. It is a different process. You will have to do something you're probably not used to doing, and we'll ask a question here in a minute. And it will significantly help reduce uh, incident response cost. When we had to bring in Mandiant a second time, it was very quick that they realized and we verified through their realization we didn't need them anymore. We had found what we needed. They verified, yep, we found pretty much everything, and off the door they went. Saved us a lot of money. That's a big goal, yay, win for InfoSec. We now save the company money. So when they have to respond or you have to call them and you do this, you're going to save a significant amount of money because they don't have to start from scratch. That's a key point here. So again, just think vulnerability management, but yet with dark malware here. Right? Got malware? Want some? we got lots. So how do you do it? Three components. The concept of a master file repository, the MFR. Malware management. Think vulnerability management, same kind of idea. And then the tools you're going to use, whatever they might be. Of course, we've got to have pictures to make it easy for people to comprehend. And so there's your repository. Notice it is not on the wire. Thumb drive, CD drum, I don't care how you do it, DVD, etc. But basically, that's a concept. You've got an info six system you might actually use to execute against. Uh, we have big fix. We deploy scripts to big fix. We can send big fix out, do it, collect it, real easy to do. Um, and then you basically target your systems and say, Hey, this is everything I know. Now, can I compare it to something I know that's absolutely good? Use the good to find the bad. So again, master file repository, think of it as a brand new build. Everybody's got standard workstation builds, standard server builds. Well, maybe not standard server builds, but you could. You can get a, a beefy box, an old server, put VMware. We use the XSI for ours. Put VMs in there. Load Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows XP, whatever you have. Your turnkey image, load the stuff up. And that's the and I'll plug it from the wire, connect it long enough to patch, download all your updates, however you want to get them, install applications, download your updates, do the Adobe, do the Chrome, do the Firefox, etc. Take them off the wire. Real simple concept here. That's a lot of files that are going to be on those boxes that you can absolutely trust. But everybody agree that basically that's a very trusted, what's in that box at that moment in time is very trusted. Show of hands, people kind of agree with this. So it doesn't require a lot of time. We monitor new applications being installed roughly amongst a thousand users and several thousand servers. It's surprising how little new software gets added. It's kind of like a spotty thing. Two or three, blunk. Two or three, blunk. So it's real easy for us to keep up. I think you'd actually be surprised how little users install software over time. It's a bell curve. They build a system and they install a boatload and then it really drops off and you have little spikes. So from a keep it up perspective, it's actually pretty easy. It doesn't require you know, enterprise hardware. We're talking, give me whatever you got. Because the system doesn't really have to do anything. It's just holding files. Install all your apps, your WinZips, your 7-Zips. Talked about that, right? All your browsers, whatever you have, whatever you see in the wire, whatever you know about, just install these things. Uh, I've got licensing issues. What do I do about that? Well, you can just copy the files, extract them, deal with your vendors, and see. Unplug when you're done. Can't say that enough. Update whenever you update. Test group goes out. Oh. I got to update my stuff too. Plug it in, plug it out. I think there's a commercial like that. Just plug it in, plug it out. Jedi tip. 
If you combine this new application set with your application approval process, then you're killing two birds with one stone. What I mean by that is, how many people here have a website that they send users to where they can click and download and install applications? I've worked for a couple as a consultant, and really nice to see. So the users can go to this site and download anything off of it. If you do that, then you know everything on there. When you first get a new request and you go through the request process, you take a copy and install it on your MFR, and now when it shows up in your environment, you've already taken care of it. So if you close that loop, it's going to save you a whole lot of time. Not a lot of people do that. Really? Process. Different process, but similar. You may use the SSCM or whatever to push out the same kind of thing. But open help this ticket, make a request, I want to use this, boom. So if you can get tied into that, big vantage there. Did we say unplug it? We cannot stress this enough. Think RSA, bit nine. These systems are online, they stay online. If you want to trust a system, do not leave it online, period. Unplug the dang thing. There is no reason for it to be on the wire. If you've ever been to a malware analysis class, what do they tell you about your VMs? Do not put this on your production network. If you want the Malwareans not to crawl around your network and get the system, don't have it online. Ethernet cable, unplug. Ethernet cable, plug in. I mean, practice that, right? Put a condom on the end of the plug if you have to. Hey, safe surfing. You could highly isolate on a VLAN, but do we really trust that? I don't. Our recommendation here is unplug this VM. It's a desktop that sits underneath your desk, sits in your little lab area. You load it up with VM, VMs, multiples. You load your stuff on there. It doesn't take very long. Patching will take you far longer, by the way, than what I'm just talking about building it and everybody's not yet. And you want one of each type, XP, whatever, application, whatever. You can do it by, a lot of companies have this concept of I have a build for department X and I have a build for department Y and a build for department Z, then build it that way. Use the process you already have for build systems. And of course, you'll be malware free if you kind of practice this. Happy, happy Darth there. So incident response, we talked about this. Mm, an incident you have, need help you will. So yes, investigate the suspect system. You've got this MFR built now, so I'm going to investigate a system that's something funky, whatever the triggers are. They can be anything that causes you some suspect. You, in our case, we do this proactively now. We don't wait for something to happen. We actually watch our environment all the time. Use your repository to eliminate files that you know are good because you just built this thing up. You are getting rid of a lot of hay. There's going to be very little left when you, do, when you practice this. And again, you haven't bought anything yet. And if you bring in a incident IR people and you say, hey, I need some help with this incident, um, you're going to show them this and say, and by the way, there's only these hundred or thousand files that I'm concerned about. Man, how fast is that to analyze, right? Much easier than looking at a whole system and say, I think it's on that box. And I've heard stories by incident response people that say, I, that one server's compromised. He goes in and looks and he runs the agent on everything else and suddenly you find a hundred that are compromised, right? So this is a big advantage to IR people, your own as well as the external folks. And again, saving money. This is a win for InfoSec. You want to know how to convince management why you need to do this, why you need the hardware? This is why. It's going to save you money. If you've spent that money of the numbers we saw earlier, I, trust me, you'll understand. We, we definitely do. And yes, you can use external repositories, but might I point out that too was breached. So do you really trust these external repositories? You know your environments better than anybody. You know what applications you use better than anybody. You're familiar with those applications, the files that they install. You are the trust factor here. No longer the external entity that costs money to pay a lot of money to do it. You guys trust your own application space. And again, treat malware like uh, vulnerabilities. It really is no difference. Understand the behavior. Use this data to know what to look for. We're not talking about CNC callbacks. We're talking about the, the where it resides, what the file extensions are, the unique things. I dropped this file on this box. How do I find that? Get rid of the good. All that's left is stuff to investigate. Exclude the knowns, and the unknowns will appear. It'll be a lot easier. So again, vulnerability management, malware management. The takeaway here, Jedi tip, is these are locations, file types, variables, percent temp, et cetera, reg keys. So if you study this and you put a spreadsheet together of the stuff that you see fairly regularly, if you're in the financial industry, you're going to be really interested in the financial bots. And you kind of understand where they're going, then the tools you have, like we have Big Fix, we put an analysis in for Big Fix, we can go out and look for that data. So Jedi tip, if you're taking notes, this is one good tip I got for you. Monitor program data, any new files or new directories. Monitor percent temp, not only Windows temp, but the user's temp directory. As a user space, it gets dropped there first before the user clicks on something and it will get in pushed elsewhere. So monitor that, that's where you look first. Monitor Windows directory, they drop files in there for DLL injection, launching of Explorer, et cetera. They'll drop new files in System32, 
They'll put log files in places like fonts and the systems, users, profile directory, system32, config, system profile, blah, 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 update a local. And definitely look at WBM directory. That is a very popular place to look. So you're looking for these tidbits and you're going to basically start using the malware management framework with your repository to look in these locations, scripting it or, or elsewise, to be able to start discovering these oddities. Hey, WBM, a new file shows up. I'm going to investigate that. Bam, you're alerted pretty quick by your scan. So how do you do it? Traditional forensics, too slow, takes too much time. We asked that question in the beginning, so definitely an issue in regards to that scenario. But you can use SHA-1 Deep. How many people here have used the MD5 and SHA-1 Deep tools? Should be a lot of hands raised here. Uh, SS Deep, if you want to use that funny, weird hash thing that they do. Uh, SIG check, recurse the directories. You're basically going to do that on your MFR. It's going to go through the entire disk. You now have a huge file of hashes that you can then use, point to the suspect system too. They, the tools let you do this. And then bam, it will compare that system to your big file list. Put it on a CD if you want read-only, put it on USB, make it read-only so it can't be altered. And then you very quickly can run this against a target system and say, hmm, I got the short list I have to investigate now. It's much easier. Or to hand off to another person to investigate. Community effort. If you guys want to write something to exploit these kind of tools, great. Share it with us. We'll put it on the community website, which is malwaremanagementframework.org. You'll see that URL later. And we'll put anything clever you do in this space, this kind of self-crafted space. So hands, that's, that's the old-fashioned manual method. How many people here want to see a faster, better way? Big majority of you, probably easily half the room. How about a tool that's more specific with intelligence that deals with this? So again, to eliminate the hay, to find the needle. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ian, and I'd like, like to introduce the Sniper Forensics Toolkit. Take your it. All right. OK. So we're good. All right, so what is it? Uh, so the Sniper Forensics Toolkit is basically what we came up with from our own experience. Uh, we've done a lot of this research, and every time we get involved with one of these cases and we're, we're spending all this time, you know, you get a lot of great information, some of your best information from doing all the detailed forensic stuff, right? But you can't do that for every case, and you just can't do that stuff quickly enough for the business. You get into a breach scenario, and what's going to happen? You've got management breathing down your neck, asking you every minute, what's going on? What's going on? How, how are you doing? Well, a good answer is not, well, I'm re-imaging this disk, and that's going to take about, oh, maybe about eight hours. And then after that, I'll be able to start processing some results, so forth, right? It just, it's, it's a bad answer. You've got uh, your, your Windows teams and your, all your server guys trying to figure out, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to change? Where's the holes? What do we need? You know, everybody's waiting. Everybody's in this lockdown mode, but they don't know what action to take or not to take. So we need something fast. And so what we did is we designed this that basically helps you identify, takes those for con forensics concepts that we use, right? And we put that into this piece of software to be able to identify those things fast and be able to give you actionable information. So we use this to eliminate a lot of the hay uh, automatically, and it just makes it easier, faster, better to use. And we'll show you why. It also doesn't require any infrastructure. This is an agent plus cloud-based solution, so you don't have to have a, uh, a box that you put on your network. You can get up and running very quickly with just installing something and letting it run. Um, so very, very simple deployment. Works great for incident response. Works better if you have it installed before you have an incident. But unlike a lot of other products, like file change detection products or um, you know, sort of your common application whitelisting solutions where you have to baseline a system, those things don't know if you're already infected. This will. And any IT professional can use it. So uh, I guess I should be looking down here. Uh, so it performs analysis across all of your executables on your system. All right, it's going to identify suspicious and bad files. So there's known malware. It'll run through hashes against, you know, your, your uh, uh, the, instead of your one AV engine, your 46, whatever. We've got some partnerships there with folks. Uh, so you'll be able to identify those things already right off the top of the bat. Boom. Uh, identifies revoked certificates. So Windows does a horrible job at uh, identifying revoked certificates. Uh, it'll cache that data for uh, as whatever the server tells it to, and it'll store that information. So you can have a revoked certificate, and we've actually found this in practice, where you'll have a, a site that gets compromised, they get their signing certificate, they re-sign their bad code, 
And it can literally be four months before that certificate ever shows up as being revoked. You don't know. I mean, you'll literally look at it and it'll say everything's good. So we don't trust anything on the client side. We're checking the server side. All right. Um, and then we identify unique and suspicious files based upon information that we have. A point about the uh, certificates. We have gotten certificates that have, we're convinced, have been stolen and being used to sign stuff. We've received stuff from Lenovo, Intel, Microsoft. Some of them have been reused, meaning they've modified the file and the certificate's still intact. Um, so we've seen a stolen cases, probably issued cases, and fake cases. So they're quite clever at what they're doing to get around the whitelisting type solutions that trust stuff by certificate. So it's not a good approach. Mm -hmm. So again, eliminate the good stuff so you can find the bad. Hey, so, hey, we've got, so this is what a typical Windows system has, right? Windows is true, server 2012, Windows 7, you're typically looking at about this many files. Uh, about, on an average machine, about 75% of those files are Microsoft files. All right. With what we've got here, we've already excluded that information, so you don't have to look at any of that. All right. You can. Okay. I can focus on the rest of that. That 25%. So we right now we have a repository of about two million files, and that's growing quite a lot. Uh, so I'm going to show you a little zombie demo. What's a zombie demo? Well, it's not live. It's undead. The internet here. Is internet awful, sucks so. here. We can't we can't rely on a good demo with the internet. All right, because let's get into it, man. Let's freaking show you this thing. All right, so first thing you got to do, register register up for an account. Go to the website, register here. There's We're going to ask you for um, a lot of information on here for authentication purposes, two-factor. All right, we're going to grab some stuff. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable inf uh, putting that in, that's okay. You can use the other, other process of doing all the stuff manually. Uh, but that's to make sure that we keep uh, as much of the chaff out of the system as you can. So you create an account, you go and you install the client. That's the install. Put in a, your username, your, uh, your account good, and your unique install password. You're not putting in a username and password here when you install it on the client because we don't trust the client. We assume that this client has malware installed on it. It'll install, it'll scan in the background, it'll automatically upload its metadata results to the cloud servers. You can then come back in to the web console, log in, and view your results. Now again, we're all about action, right? We want to get as much of out of the manual process as we can, eliminate as much of the hay, and get to actionable details. So that's why we have this dashboard. Here's an example right here. So this, we loaded the system up with some, some malware so we could demonstrate some of this stuff here. So this is a particularly infected system. By the way, if you put about 13,000 pieces of malware on a system and you do have some AV products on there, they freaking flip, frick, they go crazy. Your system does not work well after that. Even, it's not infected, it just, the shit just, it broke. So, all right, so on this computer, for example here, you've got one computer's been detected with a positive virus detection on 20 files. Okay, nice, now, boom, right away. So you've now already had a check against all those 46 or whatever AV products. Cool. All right. Uh, and you can drill down in with more detail to get more information about it. Next one, you've got one computer that's been detected with potential virus detections. This is like really hard to see here. Potential virus detections. Okay. Uh, so if you guys do a lot of analysis and you upload your, your data sets, you'd probably be familiar with the fact that uh, it's not uncommon to get one or two or three hits uh, on, you know, on these sites uh, for saying, yeah, it's malware. You'll get the suspicious, the heuristic stuff, you know, based upon our analysis, we're seeing about one, you know, we're triggering about one to three file, one to three hits. Um, so we consider those to be suspicious. It's a wild jump usually to go to from one to three, and then there's a big gap in between, and then you get around uh, 10, 20, 30. They tend to all pick them up at about the same time. There's a there's a little a little time gap, but not much. Uh, and then we're finding files that have the revoke certificate. So okay, here's something to go and check. Let's drill and in, drill into some more detail. So just the things right off the top of the bat where you can take action on it right away. Okay, here's some stuff I need to go and look at right now. And we'll give you some dashboard activity. You can see what's going on in your network, the new certificates, programs, files that have been discovered over time. 
And we have a little dashboard here that shows the virus scan progress is going on in the background as we're checking your hashes at server side and checking your content. Uh, certificate validation process, which is going through and checking all your certificates to make sure that those are all cool. Uh, unique file tags. So you can tag these files to respond what you want to do with them. If you want to say that they're untrusted, if they're trusted, if you want to defer them and, and, and do more analysis on them later, you know, come back to it. So it'll show you a breakdown. And then we give you a, a top 10 products that are installed across your environment. And so what you can use that for is you can use that to help build out your master file repository. You can take those files and say, okay, this is what I have most of. So if I do the top one, that's going to go and eliminate most of my stuff. And you can just go through and chunk through that. So that'll help you build your master repository. Now, once you get into some of the detail, here's the kind of screen you get. So this is the certificates tab view. And we show you what the who the certificate is signed by, the unique computers that it's installed on, the unique files that have that certificate across your system, and the status of that, what the result was from our server-side checking. Programs view. So this is the collection of programs. So these represent, so you may have Adobe Flash, whatever, right? You have a certain number of files that are associated with that. So this will show you that program and that version of all those files. Again, the unique number of computers and files that are associated with that. Do you have one computer that's got one program and it's got a weird program name associated with it? You're probably going to look at that and go, what the heck is going on? So you'll see those standouts. You can sort, you can, you can do all sorts of filtering. Um, to uh, drill down and see more information. You can also go right from here and tag those and look through and go, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and trust that. I just installed that program. I'm gonna go ahead and trust that. So you can eliminate that, hey, every time you do that, your view gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Unique files. So these are the actual individual unique by not just SHA, not just a hash, but there's multi-factor behind it. So we're eliminating the collision issue. Um, this will show you a lot of detail on the file, the file details themselves. There's a lot of other information that's not shown on here, but you can select from some of the drop downs. You can add additional columns, expand it out. You can get a lot of information on these files. It's the same kind of stuff you would go through if you're doing a manual analysis on these systems, right? Let me look at this. Let me do the, let me do the SIG check. Let me do the, you know, look at all the properties of the file. Let me see, you know, all this, all this detail. Let me get some information about it. So it's just in one easier view. Click on the next tab, file instances. Where are these files located? So I can click on the unique file here, right? And I can drop over to that file instance view. And now I can see where all of those files and all the instances of those files are. All right, you don't care necessarily you want to see a view where I see all the files across my operating system. I want to know how many unique files. What are the, what are the unique files? It may be named five different things in five different locations, right? Again, eliminating the hay, trying to get you to the, the, the information that you can act on as, uh, the fastest, quickest as possible. So this unique file, are you just focusing on executables and DLLs? Right now we're focusing on executables. The fact that it's a DLL is, is irrelevant. We're doing a DP. Yeah. Kind of a neat thought there is, um, in the course of us dealing with some advanced malware, if we chop the head off a snake, I don't care if the body's lying around, the stuff can't run anymore. That's really the goal here is to find that head of the snake so we can clean up and move on. All right. So, again, you can use this information to update your master file repository. Uh, you, what The easiest thing to do here is you identify which system is going to be your master repository. You go in the console and you tag that computer as a master. When you do that, every file that comes in here is automatically tagged as trusted, as tagged as, tagged as master, and you don't have to see it in your view anymore. It's gone automatic. So again, reducing that hey, further, further down. Yeah, you install one app on across ten thousand systems, ten thousand files plus all the associated programs with that disappear. You just have to do it once. Yeah. So it definitely has a huge game. And if that system is just part of your if you've got a, a, a system that you bring up and you push with whatever your software deployment stuff is and you just push to that one and then let it go and, and scan and, and upload, boom, automatic. I mean there's there's like no effort all right, I'm now, shocked how little effort it is. I mean, honestly, we were thinking it would be much more to start installing these apps and watching people install stuff. Surprisingly low. If you have software licensing limitations, let's say that you only have three copies of software XYZ and you can't install that on a master repository system. That's okay too, because what you can do is you can go in, 
best thing to do would be upgrade that system component. Whatever that program is, upgrade it. You'll see in the console that it's got a new date associated with it. It just got imported. And you can go in and you can tag that. Say, I'm going to tag that as trusted. Boop, boop, all these files are just new. As a side note, because we're recording timestamps server side, we know when the files are uploaded. We know when changes are happening, right? So the whole issue of what's the real timestamp of that file doesn't matter anymore. Something new just got added to that system, right? The file date on it may be, you know, from 2009 or whatever. You, typically what they do is they, they set the file timestamp to be the same as whatever version of Windows that you have installed. Right? Whatever that version is, whatever those DLL versions are, it'll be the same same day time stamp. July 14th, 2009. But, but with this, you'll know right away. That was new. So what we did here as an example is we took a system, we ran the master, ran a master against it, and then we uh, added some files. We added some regular files. We added some malware just to show kind of how it looks. And this is stuff we've actually seen. So it's a little bit blurry on here to see. It gets a little bit small. But the first one that we have up here is, which one is it? The pointer. All right. Is, all right. This one is 7-zip. So we, had in, we knew we had installed that one. Uh, the next one here is our software. We knew that was on there. This we added it intentionally like that. Uh, we have a Lenovo group file here. This is CamMute, and we see the date that it was added. Uh, a Microsoft file, another Microsoft file. Not all files have program data associated. Warning. Yeah. <laughs> Might want to look at that one. So those are kind of interesting just on their own, uh, but it's not it's not all that uncommon. But it gives you another thing to look at, depending especially depending upon where that is located in the proximity of other uh, system DLLs. So let's drill down to one of these files. So here we have, this is the camera driver. So we had a system that had created a new directory called camera under program data with this new DLL, but we hadn't made any changes. That was malware. So we checked into that one and said, yep, AV never triggered on this. This is unknown to AV. So, but just the fact that, hey, we've got this new thing. Let's check out this new thing. What is that? That was a big, a big sign. Another one here, this one, is a file called intel.exe, and it's sitting in program data directory. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with program data directory, but generally, stuff doesn't sit in the main program data directory. It creates subdirectories under there. This one didn't. Intel.exe, very strange. Malware. And what, of course, these aren't in the master file repository. Uh, and then these two, these two Microsoft files, all right, Windows operating system. Uh, docproc.dll, encryptbase.dll, and okay, everything looks pretty good here, all right, except there's no certificate associated with it. Usually, uh, there's most of the, a lot of the Microsoft files are signed. These ones are not. Um, but more importantly, it's a Microsoft file. Yeah, the Microsoft file is in the repository. Why is that there? We didn't patch. There weren't any patches going on. There wasn't, I mean, it's, it's not new. What's going on? Uh, that one was also malware. This one was uh, WinNTI. And then this one here, this is the file instance view of one of the files. Shows where it's living. We renamed it so it didn't actually execute on our system because we don't like that. Um, and uh, here it is sitting in Windows System 32 WBEM. So WinNTI. Uh, Number one alert, you want to set up an alert to look for. This directory is the one alert I send to the server team. If you see anything show up on this directory, something bad's happening. Because we've excluded everything that's there normally. And Microsoft does not do much here. And this is DLL injection 101 right here. Yep. So we didn't have to know. AV didn't have to pick on it, up on it. AV didn't. Uh, Never does. We, yeah. Uh, the, the name of the file is normal name of the file. But the fact that we know what our good stuff is allowed us to find out what this one was, and it showed up right away when we were looking, if you're looking. This is that, so that file right there is kind of a system Oracle, so you can't get data access. That particular file is... You give yourself the security. Right. That one was a... Uh, well, if I'm answering your correction right. This was a injected DLL. Yep. So yeah. a mod They can if they do that, but we see this stuff. We look 
Whatever. Yeah, Whatever. most of the files are owned by a trusted installer. There's a few that are owned by administrator in there. But in this particular case, this is a copy of the actual their their PE infect. They take a copy of load perf DLL, script based DLL. They modify it with PE infect and they drop it in WVM. Then when WMI loads and stops and launches and loads, these DLLs get called because they're associated with an executable. It's a fundamental flaw of Windows. You get a DLL sitting next to the executable, it will call it long before it calls it where it's trusted. And it's a Microsoft's broken. I don't care if you're a guest user. You've locked down that box, you've hardened that box, you're screwed. So yeah. that's why this is an important way to do it. All right. This one here, Lenovo. So this was interesting because it's on a Sony. Yeah. <laughs> Where's Dave? Didn't you get a new Lenovo? I got a good camera driver for you, Dave, wherever if you want it. So here's what it is not. So this is a product that's under active development. We're doing this right. We're releasing this for early adopters right now. Uh, this is not a signature or behavior-based product, as you can see. Again, we're all about analyzing and finding the good so that we can eliminate that and see the bad. We don't care about 110, 120, 130 million new pieces of malware. It's irrelevant. Yeah. IOCs. It's irrelevant. the wrong approach now. You can't look for, you can't try to hope to find all of the bad the bad stuff. You have to own your good stuff. It's a runaway train. Yep. Uh, right now, we are not detecting memory-only malware. That is coming, and we're going to be taking advantage of all of this data to look at the in-process memory stuff. You can reverse those PEs. Uh, we're not looking for browser-only malware yet. We're focusing on the big stuff right now, uh, and we're looking at things that are persistent, but this will be coming along. Uh, so we're not seeing SAD or meta exploit, memory only exploits, because again, the, the uh, in memory stuff. Dave's moving a lot towards making all of his stuff Java based. You know, basically, we've talked about this where he's only in memory trying to get some creds to further establish himself. And so uh, basically, that's something we'll look at. But right now, if he's going to persist, he has to write to disk. In some way. Yep. And we're also right now not looking at document files. So any of these jars, all this stuff, we're looking at the persistent stuff. That'll come along later. And those will and download something bad and we'll catch those. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, we don't well, I don't care what the file extension is. Yeah. We're do we're doing a deep dive into the PE. And we're actually pulling out and looking at so there's a very well there's a well-defined PE and cough and uh, uh, standard for how these files are supposed to be constructed. And then there's the reality of how they really are. And, <laughs> and so, um, so we're looking for anything that is unusual, abnormal. Uh, but anytime it's an executable, we will find it. Um, it doesn't matter what the file is called, where it's at. Yeah. Yep, we got it. Done. We're yeah. taking the concept that the client's going to get popped, okay? Because it, protecting that is just almost impossible in our opinion. Um, right. You're going to use FireEye and things like that to keep it from getting this far, but if it does get through whatever you're going to have and it gets to that disk, man, we got you. Yep. All right. So, next steps. So, next steps. Got some t-shirts coming up here, five minutes. Go build a repository and use it. How many people here think that building this repository is hard? Yep. One one person out of the room thinks it's hard. Why is it hard? Chip away, chip away, chip away, chip away. Yep. Now, there's a way to deal with that. Um, in our case, we have five versions of the same thing. Wins up A, B, C, D. Run Big Fix or SSCM. Delete those programs, and then the user will install the latest version, and boom, they're clean, right? So there's a couple ways to deal with that. But yes, you don't have to do this all in a week or a month. You can do it over time. Well, they don't have to change. That's the thing. This doesn't change the user's behavior. Process in general? Good deal. I was just going to ask you, uh, like in a server environment where you've got a couple gold builds, yep. all this, that kind of thing. How do you verify that gold build is good? Well, I don't. Somebody else does. Well, I, there you go. <laughs> but like in the laptop environment, you've got different departments, finance, legal, whatever. Yep. Yep. And then there's the personal stuff they want to put on there because yep. it's an open source tool. It, it sounds like uh, the MFR could be still pretty, 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 pretty bigger. It will get bigger. There's no doubt. You will install these things and you will add it. Hard and to define. I mean, it's, 
every time a user installs a new product, you install a new product. When you see it show up and however you're monitoring that, you install it on the MFR, now 10,000 systems, 20,000 systems, now bloop, if they have that, that application set. Like That's okay. 95% you, you know, of your environment is going to be very similar, very small, and it goes like this. So go after that 80% rule first and worry about that 20% later. Yes? So the comment, uh, the comment is, how do I check on agents? You're going to be able to monitor in our console when an agent doesn't check in, thus you'll investigate. Uh, so if you need a, uh, an appliance on site, then you're not a candidate for this because you won't allow that traffic. That, that's definitely correct. Catch. <laughs> Has anybody compromised your agent? Has anybody? Not that we're aware of, no. Yeah, it'd be hard because we have this two-factor concept, and so it'd be pretty tough. And your MFR doesn't affect everybody else in the room; it only affects you. And then we have our MFR. So, but also, but also, there's the concept that we just don't trust the we just don't trust the agent. Yeah, we don't trust the agent. Yeah, so we assume that. Yeah, inherently we don't trust it. And we auto update it. So if they compromise it, we're going to auto update it. So we've already figured out that oh, if they keep if they do it, we're just going to replace it from our repository. We're using dual. We're using dual key pairs and things like that. But ultimately, we know that there's there's always something that you can do on the client to. Yeah. There's multiple levels of obfuscation. Windows. Okay. So like, this MDU5 that is this, and really it's something else. We look at the they look at the disk the same way they are looking at the disk. So how they bypass stuff, which they we've seen in our environment, we look at places that point to that, saying it's still there, because you know Windows has multiple places. Right. So they, they have different ways of doing it. So we're looking at those secret places and the way that Windows is structured. We look at the logs and all that stuff on the disk. Are you, you going to let us see what other people are putting into their master repository? So like when uh, I, if I log in, catch. <laughs> Somebody get in the shirt. Yes, you'll be able to see. Correct. You're going to get a number count of, A, this application was seen by 25 customers a thousand times. Yeah, you are going to be able to use that data, yeah, there's a certain which helps you. That you've got to hit, right? Right. But what we won't do is we won't go and share. Uh, we're not going to go and say, oh, this one customer. You, know, <laughs> you can do it. Got to get that URL up there. Right? Because we know right. that the bad guys are going to go and want to say, oh, I targeted this unique piece of malware towards you. And I'm going to go, and I'm going to create an account, and I'm going to put that same piece. And I'm going to say, oh, this is a listen call twice. Right. right? You don't want that. Right? So we're, we're cognizant of that. Um, but one of the interesting, thing, interesting things that you can do with this cloud solution is we can go and look across, okay, there's, you know, you've installed this product. Maybe we don't have it in our master power repository, right? But we can go and we can say, well, that's installed across, you know, 3,000 other, other, uh, other people's systems, and they all have, these files are associated with this particular version. But on your system, there's this one that's different. No. In the back. So there's advantages. It's free for three users. You can use this for free. We are going to have a freemium type model. So three computers, you will be able to use this for free. Uh, we believe in giving the community something for a period of time. We do have to pay for the data storage. There will be a limited time. Uh, we haven't set that in stone yet, that the data will reside there for free. Um, but you will be able to do some basic uh, check and balances like you just saw. For free. So try it. Be an early adopter. Give it a try. Send us your comments. Those that participate will move up the ladder. The, only the data. Any files we upload go to the checkers that we have. But yeah, then you'll have to wait through the appliance piece if we get around to doing that. Wouldn't be a candidate. Yes. It is a lot of data. Yep. Uh, well, not a lot of stuff. It's there's it's the way it's structured, number one, but also encryption's in place and everything else. So we're pretty we're security people. We kind of know what's going on there. There's metadata. We know the questions on your Yeah. So we we definitely take. That.